All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Jimmy Think Tank. We meet every Wednesday to discuss um, innovation. What are the big trends in innovation that will drive the new opportunities in the world? Scientific trends, uh, economic trends, uh, uh, macro trends of, of demographics, which all give us an image, an image of what the future looks like. And based on the future, you can imagine it and see what we can do next. That's one part of it. Second one part of this whole thing is what, what, where are we going with innovation management? What's next and what else in innovation management? How do we manage innovation better? And, and today's speakers are going to talk a little bit about that also because innovation management is changing uh, in terms of the topics of what's important in the definition of innovation. Innovation was create new things, capture value. What is value? And we're talking about environment. We're talking about social. We're talking about governance. We're talking about people, planet. All those are also elements of profit, plus this other things that we should be considering. We're very excited about, about the speakers who will be speaking. My name is John uh, Herniman. He's a professor, a junk professor at HES, and he's got a vast experience, a vast experience in working with some of the biggest companies on the planet. Um, his background is physics, semiconductor physics, and uh, theoretical physics. And from that, he had, has worked at Hewlett Packard and Agilent and those great companies the companies that push science and technology to create products that we had not imagined. And then we also worked at British Telecom, Apple, Amazon, and other places. And now he's talking about something really important, social entrepreneurship. And, 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 and this is really fascinating for me because I used to work at Motorola many years ago. And we had separated out entrepreneurship with social entrepreneurship, saying, let's leave that for the outside. But what we have seen repeatedly is these companies like Hewlett Packard or Motorola, their impact on society has been far greater as every cell phone got to every human being on the planet. So are the small NGOs going to make the biggest impacts or is it going to be the corporations, the big corporations that are going to be able to push out uh, solutions that can actually benefit all segments of the population and the planet? I believe we're going to have a great conversation today with John. Um, if you don't mind, uh, okay, let's get John on the call uh, so we can see both faces. So, John, welcome. John's coming in from Switzerland. Um, good, how are you, John? Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for, for having me here today. I'm really, really excited about this and the following discussion we're going to have. John, John, your academic background, physics on one side, but now this is also social. I mean, how, how, how did that ever integrate together at a high level? Yeah, it was, it was an interesting journey. I'll talk about it a little in my talk, but... Um, I've slowly evolved from a very science background through semiconductors to then consumer electronics and then business management. And while I was engaged in business management, I started to wonder how social innovations happened in large companies. And that's when I started my doctoral research on how social entrepreneurs act in large corporations and how projects work or don't work in large corporations. Um, so it, it's been an evolution. Um, and and you know, so we'll, we'll hear a little bit about that evolution as we go through this, this conversation today. Perfect. John, so I'm, I'm not going to hold you. I'm going to get, get you started on your presentation as soon as we can. But for the audience, here's somebody who has got science and technology. He has worked in the corporations. He has done research on the topic. And he's a professor now. And so we should be getting insights with theory and frameworks as how to make social entrepreneurship real. John, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I will just start sharing my presentation. Um, someone give me a thumbs up if they can see my presentation. Thumbs up. <laughs> okay, we're great. So again, um, really excited to be here today. Um, just for reference, um, I'm, I live in Switzerland at the moment, so I'm, it's mid-afternoon for me, so I'm relaxing through the afternoon of the day. I know everyone comes to this talk at a different stage in their, their day, so I'm going to be relatively gentle on the subject of bringing you into the topic and maybe just getting us to the stage where we can have an interesting discussion at the end of the topic. So today, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. And my main passion is around social entrepreneurship. And what I mean by that is people who already work in organizations, have jobs in organizations, and want to actually do something innovative in those organizations, and they want to do something innovative 
which actually contributes not only to the company's profit, but also to society in some respect, either environmental, sustainability, um, or social and workers' equity, workers' rights. So we're going to explore a little um, uh, in this talk about the innovation, a good innovation process, um, a, a suggested innovation process to do this. And then we'll talk about some barriers and issues um, that social entrepreneurs face in organizations and how they might overcome um, those barriers and issues. So first of all, I'm, I'm putting up a quick summary of the talk. So anyone who suddenly says, oh, this doesn't sound interesting at all. You can, you can run away at this stage. Um, what we're going to talk about um, over the next 20 minutes or so is why is social entrepreneurship important? Why is it difficult? How an upgraded innovation process might work? And then the barriers and enablers to social entrepreneurship. And finally, we'll talk about who actually does um, social entrepreneurship um, in organizations. I'm going to pose a couple of my questions that I'm interested in in the future um, before we drop into your questions. So with that, let's let's just set the scene here. Um, you know, sort of, we live in a world which is the population's growing, the population's aging, resources are stretched. Um, there's a need for safe communities, social safety nets, equity, equality, water and food security, improved education, better workers' rights. And on top of all that, um, fighting climate change or dealing with climate change. These are a big pile of large and complex issues. And traditionally, governments, policymakers, NGOs, charities, social enterprises, and local communities have all worked on these. Um, and they work on them today. One thing I should point out at this stage uh, and is I'm always conscious of is wherever you are in the world, you'll see this mix of challenges and who traditionally works on them slightly differently. It varies by culture, it varies by geographic region, but typically people have relied on governments and policy makers to deal with social needs. That's great, but these organizations are struggling to meet this ever increasing load on them. And the bit that was is really missing from this picture is where do businesses fit in in this picture? Um, typically, businesses aren't really discussed that much when it comes to talking about you know, sort of climate change or how do you create safe, safe communities. Um, businesses aren't front and center on that. And I, I'm going to propose there's two reasons why they should be. One is um, often they can be part of the problem. They can con contribute to these problems through their business actions. But more importantly, businesses have huge resources, huge reach, and a really great wealth of skills available to them. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen these statistics before, but um, Apple's um, valuation is bigger than 96% of the countries in the world's GDPs. Um, there's only seven or eight countries which have a GDP which is bigger than Apple's um, evaluation. Same is roughly true for Microsoft and Amazon. So when we think about like that huge amount of wealth and resources and the world's problems, there's a great opportunity there um, for contributions to be made. The second element, though, reach is also important. Facebook, for example, touches 3 billion people across the world. There's not many governments or policymakers who get that opportunity to touch and interact with that many people. And then also these large corporations have a huge um, skill set available to them. Companies like Nestle or Procter & Gamble have food scientists, people who really understand supply chain, agriculture, a great skill set which could be applied to many of these, these problems in the world. So I propose that we um, you know, sort of that 
um, large corporations are an important part of how we meet um, social needs moving forward. So how does it look? Here's, here's the quick definition of social entrepreneurship that I use time and time again. Um, the social entrepreneur is someone who's already in a, a corporation. Um, from my personal interest, the ones which are most interesting are the large multinationals, um, the large for-profit corporations. The social entrepreneur is executing programs, innovations, which not only meet the traditional profit goal of the organization, but they're also supplying some sort of social benefit um, to the world at the same time. They're meeting society's unmet needs and they're actually carrying out innovation. Um, they're not just doing more of the same, whatever the company's doing today. Um, and, and that would be true in CSR. Um, you know, so they're not just doing more of the CSR stuff. They're actually innovating and breaking new ground, either with new processes or new outcomes um, as they move forward in this. So this all sounds great. We've got big companies, great wealth, great capabilities, you know, sort of, um, and we've got a definition of people in the companies who may do this. Um, sounds wonderful. But why aren't we hearing about it all the time? Why isn't this happening all around us everywhere? Um, when I was doing my research, um, someone came up with this, this interesting perspective that the real challenge with corporate social innovation is the three words it's made up of. Corporations, social and innovation just don't go together. They're, they're actually, they're not aligned. They don't just don't play together well. And we'll talk about that a little bit now. You know, so we live in a, a world which is volatile, it's complex, it's uncertain, it's ambiguous. It's the typical Bucca, um approach to the world. And corporations are somewhat unique in their ability to produce stability and reproducibility in this chaotic world. They, the successful corporations in the world are successful because they can take this chaos and build a set of norms and processes and reproducibly deliver their results time and time again. Um, you know, sort of in full disclosure, one of the things I teach at the, the university I work at is business quality, um, which really does, you know, sort of thrive around how do you define what your customers want? How do you make it time and time again? How do you become reproducible? So basically, corporations have built the box that we often say that we should think outside of. The business norms um, and the, the boundaries around our thinking are often constructed by corporations to make them successful. So you may have heard this term before, the paradox of embedded agency, the challenge of someone who works in a corporation, being able to choose to do something different in that organization, being able to choose to innovate outside the norms of that organization is a big challenge. And, and that's where social entrepreneurship um, really does have a challenge, where we're suggesting we have a, a stable environment, but we're going to break some of those rules to do something slightly different from what the corporation's there for. OK, at this stage, before we go into the challenges, I'm just going to give a brief history of myself. Um, in the introduction, we covered most of this history. Um, I come from a very scientific um, background, a theoretical physicist um, who moved into semiconductors, who then moved into consumer electronics, got very excited about the business aspects of innovation, technical innovation. I worked at Amazon, Apple, um, Hewlett Packard, British Telecom all looking at creating new and innovative products. At that same time though, I touched upon and got involved in some social impact projects, solar initiatives, um, environmental cleanups, workers' rights um, in factory activities. And one of the things which made me very curious is sometimes these would go really, really well. Sometimes they'd be easy to do 
everyone would be on board. Everyone would say, this is great. We should be doing this. And the organizations would, would actually do it rapidly and it would be embedded and it would become part of the organization structure. Other times, seemingly randomly, some of these initiatives would become really hard to move forward, even though they were morally right, they were socially right, they would just be really hard work. This piqued my scientific interest. So I actually embarked on doctoral research, um, looking at how individual social entrepreneurs in companies would go through their journey. What would make their journey successful? What would make their journey unsuccessful? And what you're gonna see um, probably in the next 15 minutes max is a compressed version of eight years of research, hundreds of hours of interviews, and also a compressed version of my corporate social innovation um, lecture sequence, which is 60 hours of lectures I've tried to compress it into about 15 minutes. So I apologize if it's if it's just a random walk of, of terms being thrown up. But if anyone's interested in hearing more, you can contact me on LinkedIn and we'll go into far more detail after this. So this is where we start our journey. So one of the things, the next two things we're going to look at, we're going to look at how the innovation process works. And I'm slightly opinionated on how you create a good innovation process, which allows social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in general to thrive in a corporation. Um, and then we'll talk about more specifically what barriers and what mitigation social entrepreneurs can, can interact with. So I'm gonna introduce there's two types of there's lots of types of innovation, but I'm just gonna simplify our world down to two types. One is a discovery type innovation. Someone comes up with a new battery technology. Um, they suddenly say, I have this new battery technology. This new battery technology is great. I need to look for a marketplace or a beneficiary for this. For the rest of this talk, we're not going to deal with that left-hand side. We're gonna focus on innovation around people who say, hey, if I put this idea with this idea, suddenly I have a new way of solving an existing problem. It might be a social problem. It might be we are sort of with people, people equity. It might be a sustainability problem, or it might be a profit problem in the business. Often in for-profit businesses, Innovation is putting together two ideas which already exist and saying, hey, we've got something unique here and it will solve this problem for this person. And so I view problem or innovation around starting with the beneficiary. That beneficiary might be a customer in a for-profit business, but it might also be a customer and the community. And starting looking at the problem from the beneficiaries um, viewpoint. So the goal here is even at the stage where you're writing down the problem on the back of an envelope is to start with the problem which is being solved. Truly understand what problem am I solving here? Who is it a problem for? How do they experience it as a problem? And why is my solution so compelling in this in this problem space? So it's designing the innovation around looking at the outcome rather than the inputs to the innovation. And so in this new battery discovery, we talked about an alternative way of thinking of this would be, hey, I have a problem. I realize lots of people have solar panels, but they have no way of storing the energy hey, if I put together this new battery technology, the solar panels people have, I can actually sell a pile of these new batteries. I can do profit. I can save emissions. Um, I can also enable more people to have electricity and lighting at night in their homes. I, you know, so I can make the, the triple bottom line impact on the world by focusing on solving this specific problem, like people not being able to store energy from their solar panels. Okay, so we talked about the importance of defining the problem. We're gonna look at the um, innovation cycle in three, three basic stages, and I'm gonna propose 
a very left-hand sided weighted view to innovation here. Um, often businesses start their innovation process with a vague idea. They say, let's play with it for a while, let's prototype. And if it's looking good and we feel good about it, we'll start scaling it up. What I've seen which works well, especially in the entrepreneurship area, is a couple of key things. The first thing is, from a business point of view, businesses which can design innovation as a meritocracy in the business um, really have a different perspective and a different culture around innovation in the business. So by meritocracy, I mean the, the process of innovation and what ideas get selected, what ideas get developed, what ideas get scaled is clear, it's transparent, and it's fair across the business. So anyone can come along with an idea and the ideas are evaluated based on the idea and not what your job title is in the business. It's a big difference, you know, sort of it's, it's not the ideas come from the CTO in the business. And if the CTO didn't think of it, it's probably not worthwhile. It's if a great idea comes from a warehouse worker who's developed a new battery technology, we're going to listen to it. We're going to evaluate it. And the way this I've seen happen in multiple businesses in my, my career is using a backcasting or a working backwards style approach at these early ideas. Um, it's creating a meritocracy, first of all, that anyone can enter this innovation process at the ideation stage and pose an innovation. And the way each of these innovations are structured to evaluate whether they're actually worthwhile moving forward is a working backwards process or a, or a backcasting process. It's used in education. It's used a lot in Amazon, um, where you actually look at the final outcome of what you're doing. You actually visualize yourself one year in the future or five years in the future when this innovation is actually being delivered to the beneficiaries and you describe what it's going to look like when the first one gets sold or delivered, like who's it going to be sold to? How are they going to use it? How are they going to get hold of it? And what problems are going to solve for them? Um, in the Amazon environment, they, they tend to describe this in a press release. They make a fake press release when they're first coming up with the, the concept um, of a product. And it describes the day of the product being released, like what would be in the paper on that day, who they'd be targeting that press release at. And it's written in a way that the customer or the beneficiary understands the situation. That's an important stake in the ground of what you're really aiming for from the project. The second part of the working backwards process is then to go into detail on how you got to that end point and exactly what questions people would ask about this product or idea or solution and what are the real answers. Um, you know, sort of if someone says, well, that's great, you're gonna make a flying car in five years and you've described a great flying car, what color does it come in? How much does it cost? Who's gonna make it? Where's it gonna be made? How is it gonna be repaired? And the working backwards process and backcasting focuses on at the earliest stage possible, trying to answer all the questions that typical businesses try and answer as they go through the process. It poses these questions really early on to check that you really do have a compelling solution and it really is going to, to solve the problem. The second element, taking this, let's say we have a great idea, it's agreed, um, people say, yeah, that's a great vision, I love the detail, I believe you can make it for $100 and you're gonna deliver it and you're gonna sell 100,000 of whatever um, idea this is. It then moves into the prototyping and piloting stage, a very, very typical um, approach to development. But using this stake in the ground at the beginning, the prototyping and piloting is always evaluated by what you agreed to do at the start. 
And it really lends itself to the lean um, startup approach um, to, to how you develop products that you work out very, very quickly. Are you on track or aren't you on track? Are you going to deliver what you promised originally? Or if you're not going to deliver what, what you promised originally, that you actually go back and you either pivot, you rework, or you shut down the project. The reason this fits into this meritocracy of um, development or innovation is if people know this is the process, that you're making a commitment, you're being evaluated about the commitment along the way, people actually start understanding that when a project fails, it fails because the project failed. It wasn't the, the person was stupid. It was a bad idea. It was that it, it couldn't meet the expectations of the project. It starts taking away and <laughs> depersonalizing this, this focus on failure. Was there a question? Oh, oh no. Okay, sorry. Um, so that's a key part of this proto prototyping and piloting stage. The second bit, and the reason I've got emotion versus logic, and this is one of my sideline activities that I'm really interested in, how emotion and logic play in innovation. But one of the elements of having a very well-documented objective for the project, holding the years of project to that, is to take away the emotion in um, innovation, is to move it to from the situation where someone says, this feels right or this doesn't feel right, to how do we prove that this is right or this is wrong? So moving each situation from... Uh, well, maybe it'll work out okay, we'll carry on, to how can we prove it's going to work out okay? What are the fact making it a fact-based or an evidence-based approach to decision-making? I, I often see um, all too often is projects get launched and everyone's too scared to mention what's really going on with the project um, and that it's not working out right because they don't want to be seen as failures on the project. And coming up with this much more evidence-based approach forces that issue to surface those things. So a company doesn't go through a five-year development only to release something which isn't that great at the end of the day. And most of the project team could have told you that halfway through the project. The last bit on this upgraded approach to um, innovation is to think very carefully about scaling. The initial definition of the project should define what the scale is gonna be, like what country is gonna be targeted, what geographies is gonna be targeted. It's very common to see like someone, a company releases a successful product and then suddenly says, well, this product's been super successful in India. I'm gonna start selling this same product in China now. But it's not really a solution for those beneficiaries in China. It was designed to be a solution for people in India, and they're surprised when they try and scale it into a different, into a different region without really understanding um, the implications. This is particularly um, sensitive in social innovations where, for example, someone working on telehealth in one jurisdiction, one geography, may come up with a really compelling solution. And, and there's some, been some real cases of telehealth and telebanking where it's revolutionized banking and healthcare in a particular country. And then they've tried to extend it into the next door country. And that country has different regulations. It has different expectations of the beneficiaries. They, they're willing to share certain data and not other data. And it doesn't scale into that second geography. So one of the key elements is to think about the scaling expectations when the project's initially defined. So I think I've spent a lot of time on this, um, but you know, sort of, this is my little graphic of the innovation journey. And my view is a meritocracy, which is very heavily loaded on that left-hand side enables you to pre-predict what's going to happen with projects as they as they go through this um this innovation cycle and hopefully get them to fail early if they if they're going to fail so changing tone very slightly um 
if we're talking about social entrepreneurs in organizations, people who've come up with this, um, you know, sort of an idea, a new innovation that they want to develop um, in an organization, um, what sort of barriers do they typically experience as they're developing those ideas? And, and one way, this isn't the only way of looking at it, but this is one way of looking at it, is we can look at it from an individual level, an organizational level, or a business and society level. And we see like social entrepreneurs struggle a lot, even at an individual level with themselves and other individuals in the organization. It makes it difficult for them to move forward with an innovation. Um, there's the energy aspect. They're having to, they've got families, they've got their regular job, and then they've got this innovation they've come up with and they want to create in the organization. That's one extra thing over everyone else. Like it's a, it's a big opportunity for them to, you know, sort of run out of energy, in many cases, burnout. When I looked at social entrepreneurs, I was seeing typically um, only 30% of them stayed in their, their current job. 30% of them left the company they were working for. 30% of them moved to other um, jobs within the company. And that was partly due to the burnout and the stress that they were under. Second element that they're under, which is a barrier for them doing this, is marginalization. Like they're, they'll be called the tree hugger or the person who, you know, sort of wants to focus on saving frogs. Um, and that marginalization doesn't really help them. And then the last element is fear of failure. If you're in this job, like, do you really want to stand up and say, hey, I'm going to do this new innovation when you could keep your head down, be quiet and move forward? Secondly, at an organizational level, there's pushback like line managers. Often people will say, oh, well, one quote I remember, which I really loved, was someone was saying line managers for social innovation are like the tundra. It's where great ideas go to die. Um, they just go out there, they're, they're left and they die. I'd say it's more of an organizational challenge. Often people's direct report, um, who they're directly reporting to, are rewarded by meeting their goals, their business goals. They're not rewarded by allowing their team to go off and do crazy ideas. In fact, their you know, sort of um, rewards will be impacted by not being able to um, you know, sort of um, follow through with the business results. So like the incentive structure is very much against line managers helping people. Hierarchy is the same. You know, sort of people saying that's not my job. I'm you're not in the R and D team. You shouldn't be coming up with good ideas. Um, processes and rules. I saw situations where large corporations who are great at B two B interactions, when someone came up with um, an innovation which was great for the company, but interacted with individual customers was a B two C thing their legal team didn't have any structures to come up with legal agreements with individuals. They only had legal structures which worked on a business to business basis. And they were delivering hundred page documents to individual customers to sign. And then there's the last element, which is vision and culture and purpose of the organizations. Even organizations which are focused on social good, they might be focused on, say, an organization might be set focused on saving the forest and, the, and your innovation is about enabling education. And those two things are in conflict with each other. Um, they'll fund the saving the forest ideas, but they may not fo um, focus on years of the education. And last but not least are uh, regulations and institutional um, norms. I'll, I'll give just one example on the institutional norms. Um, you know, sort of, I know of a couple of organizations who's tried to set up innovation hubs, but the norms around their businesses and, and their cultures are people come into work nine to five. They clock in and they clock out. They clock in, they have to be in the office at nine in the morning, they have to leave by five in the afternoon. It doesn't really build an, an innovation culture because people stop thinking about work at five when they go.
And I'm conscious of time. I've got about two more critical slides and we'll be done. Um, so, so these are the barriers. What do people do about getting over these barriers so they can actually really enable social innovation in an organization? And um, this, these are, this is the most interesting slide for me in the whole talk. Um, the first thing which isn't on this slide is turning up. It's actually standing up and being a, a social entrepreneur um, in an organization. There's uh, a couple of terms for people, people like wantivators or entrepreneurs or innovators, people who say, I've got this great idea, but hey, I'm just not gonna do it. Or hey, people laughed at me the first time, so I just gave up at that stage. So there's the first step at an individual level of actually standing up and doing it. The second element is, and I saw this in very successful um, social entrepreneurs, is a combination of fitting in and standing out. So you don't have to stand out and be the radical on everything you do. You can actually be a good corporate employee, generate wealth for the company. And when it comes to a social innovation, when you stand up and say, this is important, people say, wow, we're going to listen to this person. They've got credibility. They know our business. Next element, which is related to that, is alignment. How do you align what the social innovation is to the mission and purpose of your business? Um, a couple of good examples are people identifying that their business was struggling with educated employees in different regions of the world. So they proposed that the business actually funded nearby universities got employees to become teachers at those universities to develop an employee base, um, um, a new employee base, a feeder into the system. And the real win there was an impoverished area ended up with good universities, which were well-funded with really skilled um, educators. And the business actually gained a really great um, flow of employees coming into the business. The other element that you're hearing in multiple talks is creating allies, but creating allies at multiple levels. One is to have people on your side for the innovation and have mentors. But the other thing is to create some level of movement in the organization that people are interested in what you're doing and will also critique it for you and push back on you. At an organizational level, it's building a culture which can accept failure. And one of the key elements which worked in the, the organizations which were successful at um, social entrepreneurship had cultures which would accept failure. And the way they built that was through an authentic approach of people saying things or leaders saying things, actually meaning it and actually doing it. When those three align, the saying, meaning, and doing, there's authentic things built, built up. So when the organization said it's okay to fail. We'll celebrate the fact that you tried and that they then followed through and they didn't laugh at the failures. They didn't downgrade people's jobs if they failed. It built this rigorous culture. In business and society, one thing to think about is adjacencies. You're not going to break the rules around regulations, but for example, in the banking industry, you don't want innovate too much innovation in banking but it is acceptable for, to innovate in financial education. Um, so you can actually step slightly aside of the, the organizational and the societal boundaries and do adjacent things, um, which can be very innovative. Okay, last slide of me talking, and then we will get to questions. Um, so who, who are social entre entre entrepreneurs? On the left-hand side are the typical traditional people who are expected to do development and organize or to do innovation, research and development teams, product development, marketing, the CEO, the CTO. In a real meritocracy of innovation, the employees, customers, random people from the community, just ad hoc events should feed into ideas which can be developed by the company. And then also um, things can be catalyzed. And I saw a lot of activities, social innovations being catalyzed through hubs, incubators, and even competitions. 
just cause friction, like how do we care for the elderly in their homes? Um, and people coming up with ideas which were both hugely profitable and also helped fill a societal need. So with that, we won't go into my questions, which are on my mind at the moment, <laughs> but we will, I will thank you. Um, thanks very much. I'm happy to try and answer some of your questions. I'd really love to connect with you on LinkedIn. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, this is what I look like on LinkedIn. Um, but questions, please. And thank you for listening. And sorry, it was a whistle stop tour of 60 hours of lectures in 25 minutes. <laughs> John, that was wonderful. We really enjoyed it. And um, I think you put a framework together for people to think through it and kind of guide us through this. So um, in the audience, please, um, if you have questions, um, put your hand up or write the questions in the chat. Uh, if you put your hand up, then we'll give you some spotlight. And if you put your, just write a question in the chat, then we'll repeat the question and get that out there. Let me get you guys started, John. Um, one of the challenges when I was in Motorola was as we thought of innovations and new products and services, there was a mindset the mindset was target the most exciting, most profitable segments. Uh, and usually it was the executives and others who could pay $1,000 or $3,000 for a cell phone. And we knew that with those cell phones, if we could get them to poor people and everywhere else, we could change the way they live and improve quality of life. But there was a prioritization in the organization which is profit motivated. Mm -hmm. Where is the biggest revenue? Who can we target? Who's going to pay the most? Where were the safest um, supply chains? that you could go through. And therefore we kind of postponed it. And then after 25, 30 years, it did get to the mainstream market and social impact did happen, but it never started in that way. And if I were to suggest that in the C-suite C that we should be targeting the bottom of the pyramid to help with um, education and helping with healthcare for poor people, they would have just kicked me out of the office very quickly. And so this tension of of course, we want to make the planet better. And no person, no CEO is going to say no to that as the right thing to do. But then when it comes to Wall Street, they put pressure on you saying, show me the money. So John, guidance, coaching on that very difficult conversation about walking that, that very thin line of both. That, that is an excellent question. And what it brings to mind is the banking industry for me, where the banking industry is focused around how many dollars can we make per customer? So you know, sort of when someone proposes a new banking vehicle in a traditional bank, they say, well, hey, this will target like the top 1% in the world and we can make a pile of money and we only have to service you know, sort of a thousand customers. Then you think about the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, and their philosophy was the opposite of that, is how many people can we reach? Like, how can we maximize the number of people we reach? Now, in a business, if you structure that early on problem statement about what problem are we trying to solve and what will it give to us as a business, it's like, yeah, we're going to break this mold of our our baseline of maximizing the revenue per customer. But hey, let's approach the business. Let, let's approach the process slightly differently. And can we make as much money if we service a lot of customers with very, very simple solutions, but we solve a unique problem for them? And I think you're right. It's very, very difficult in the C-suite to do this, which is part of this um, democratization or meritocracy of innovation. If all the ideas go into the same funnel and it's not judged by traditional values, it's like, is this a good idea for our business? And does it check the boxes of making the profit? Um, the same is true of, um, I'm trying to think about M-Pesa, um, the cell phone banking. You know, so that touches a lot of people in Kenya, but it's not a, a, in any one individual. It's not you're not selling a huge data plan to them, but you're touching virtually the whole country um, with it. So, yeah, this in the bottom of the pyramid thinking is more, hey, can I get the same profitability out of volume with something simpler? But I think it is something to break. It's like, how do you get those ideas surfaced? 
Um, and I can pause at this stage or I can throw in a, a little twist on this, um, which is um, someone um, I, I really respect in social innovation once said like, he used to use winning competitions and visibility and social innovation to pitch the next idea to the CEO. He didn't go and tell the CEO, CEO what he had done. When the CEO invited him into his office, he'd walk in and say, I'm not going to tell you about the thing I won the award for. Let me tell you the next idea you should be doing. And it's trying to work out how you get in front of a decision maker with this alternative view of reality. So I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> so. well, John, that's great, and, and I think everybody struggles with balancing. In 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 Jimmy, we have a definition for innovation, which sets the stage up. Which says, um, you got to create something new. Mm -hmm. You got to capture yeah. value, and the the thing on the word value is what is value, and value could include profit, people, planet, branding, and other components. And if you open up the definition of value then sometimes the C-level executives will say, oh, I get that. Or they usually get it. And so they, 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 they want to try and work on these things together. But you can't just go in there and say it's going to make this much money. You got to say it's mm -hmm. this much yeah. this much branding, and this much social value, and our employees are going to love it, and other things which are valuable too. Let me get Adi. Adi's got over there. He's got his hands up. So Adi um, goes at the monitor group. Uh, Adi, please. I'd accenture. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Satendra. Uh, so this is actually building on your, uh, on your comment. I think, John, one um, of the issues you brought up that really strike me uh, is I would call it the alignment with, with strategy. I mean, the way I think about it, it's we have this saying, doing well by doing good. And at the end of the day, companies exist uh, to drive value, as Satendra mm -hmm. said. Um, so at least kind of for my observation, I think the creating the alignment between the corporate strategy and its direction with some of those social entrepreneurship goals is, is really the key. Um, so for example, I mean, something I've seen in, in one of the companies I worked with, uh, the initiative, there was a big initiative of, um, recruiting from kind of underrepresented communities, uh, providing training, technical training uh, to, you know, high school graduates. And, and that was doing good, but it, it opened a pipeline of talent that wasn't available for the company before that. Uh, yeah. And therefore, that really reduces the tension uh, between kind of strategy and, and doing well to actually doing good. So I'm just interested kind of in, in your research, uh, what you have seen, first of all, the importance of that and what measures companies and social entrepreneurs took to create uh, that, that alignment. That excellent question again. I, I like that. And I have, I, I think you really hit on how uh, social innovation survives the immune reaction of an organization. It's, it's got, you know, it's like it needs to be aligned to the value of that organization in some sense or form. It needs to be part of the business objectives of that organization. Um, a, a couple of examples which spring to mind, um, a very simple example I was involved in is I wanted to reduce the CO2 emissions from our site on the company. And business travel and commuting were the most important things. Um, proposing video conferencing, I proposed it to the CFO. The CFO only got excited when I said, do you know how much business travel this will save us? Like they didn't need to know that it was important on CO2 emissions. So, so this is the alignment when, when it has two different flavors, two different deliverables, and you can actually choose which one you emphasize to get support. So to the people who love the local community, they love the idea of less travel, lower CO2 emissions, a commute program. The CFO loved the, the cost reductions. The same is true with like undersea servers, um, like companies who build undersea servers. The people who developed those originally wanted to do it from a climate change point of view is it lowers the cost of cooling. You drop it into the ocean, it's, it's easy to cool a server 
under the sea. But it also has these other wonderful benefits of it's much cheaper to buy land on the sea floor. Um, so for the business, they get excited, like, hey, we can put a server off of the Ivory Coast and it's um it's under the ocean and it's easy to buy an acre of seafloor um, at the same time as you're doing environmental good and you're doing social good by enabling more proliferation. So I, I think you hit on the key element there is how do you align it with something that the organization cares about? Um, there was a financial tool um, organization um, I was working with and most of their initiatives were focused on how do we educate future generations to be financially able? Yeah. Um, and their goal there was, hey, if we have a lot of financially able people in the future, we'll actually have customers. If, if like society breaks down and people aren't using financial vehicles such as credit and things like that, it's going to be really hard work for us to develop our customer base in the future. So I think, yeah, this, this synergy to why you're around as a business, but it plays into one element that's important is the business needs to know what its purpose is. Um, you know, so what space is it working in? Is it trying to feed the world? Is it trying to communicate for the world? Is it trying to, you know, sort of clothe the world? And if it is, how do initiatives fit with that and align with that? Sorry, over long answer, but I, I love the well, point. Well, yeah, I thought it was a great example. I like the business travel one because now I'm kind of yeah. going back to a comment that Tendra said. Uh, one of the other benefits is is talent retention. I mean, people mm -hmm. prefer to work, live in their communities, maybe occasionally travel, but uh, not on such a regular basis. So expanding kind of the definition of value besides the saving and travel costs, also the effect on talent, the effect of kind of connection to kind of the local business community or your customers. I mean, all those are added benefits that uh, yeah. actually can be quantified. Uh, and and actually example. extending the value concept just one little bit further is often in businesses, there's very similar ideas that can be put next to each other. And you can question like, would this add more societal value if we did it this way or this way? And often those questions aren't posed to the CEO where they get to say, oh, yeah, we could actually save this forest and do exactly the same business plan and we save the forest at the same time um so being able to surface like this additional value um is important yep thanks great adi thank you for your question um john let me jump to maybe two two two, two examples which i think and i'm hoping vince who's listening might jump in at any second <laughs> um but but let, let me just make sure um I grew up in Southern Africa, in Zambia. And whenever somebody had an inspiration for a Coke, you could find a Coke somewhere within 50 yards of wherever you were. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Coke got everywhere. And Coke got criticized significantly because it was taking money out of poor people because their whole salary for the day was very little and Coke was taking a big piece of it. But what people didn't realize was Coke was getting safe water and calories, mm -hmm. sugar, which is critical for people to work and move and and do what they had to do for a whole day. So it was actually nutrition for the poor person and clean water, nutrition and health versus being perceived as a corporate who was gouging, right? And, and, and this is the example which I keep on noticing is the big corporations have the ability to distribute things across the world. We saw the same thing with Samax in Mexico. And mm -hmm. this guy was able to get bags of cement to every village so that poor people could build a house and, and make sure that they were able to uh, you know, own their own homes sooner or later. And they thought about how to get it to the last mile. And through the process, they uncovered new ways to do things cheaper and better. And therefore, they were then able to take that up to the uh, segment above that. But the best example, and I'm going to try and see Vince's here. I hope, Vince, you can turn your camera on. Is you gave the example of M-Pesa. But there's a company in, in the Philippines called Ayala. Mm -hmm. And they, they were the ones who created Gcash. And Gcash is also M-Pesa equivalent, but they actually have got a penetration rate of about 120% compared wow. to banks, which is at about 40, 50% of some number of that type. And they're able to do financial banking now through Gcash. And the banks are, because of compliance, were not able to break through 
with all their own mm -hmm. rules and credit scores and resistance to do financing. So I am a believer that um, there's a lot of nonprofits trying to fix problems and corporates who can fix problems. And when they do it, they, they have the, the power, the power to do this kind of things. So what would your message be to CEOs of Fortune 5,000 companies, if not Fortune 50,000 companies, saying, guys, there's money to be made and you'll disrupt your business models in the process of doing this because you've got to do things differently and better, faster, cheaper. And at the same time, your employees are going to love you because you are making the planet better. And your mm -hmm. grandkids will say, thank you, grandpa or grandma, because you, you contributed to these things. How, how, would you, how would you get the CEOs to say, this has got to be a strategic pillar? Yeah. And, and I think the C, if you initially went to the CEOs and said, this has got to be the strategic pillar, the response would be, well, I never see any ideas. Like no one ever gives me this idea of you know, sort of like simple telephone banking. No one comes to me with these ideas. And I think that's the reason why I spent a bit of time on how do you rework the innovation process? So those sort of ideas get through stage one, they get to the interview stage, they get from the resume or the CV being delivered to actually have someone look at them and say, is this a good idea or isn't it? It hasn't come from our chief marketing officer, but is it a good idea or isn't it? And often that's where those ideas get killed in organizations is it doesn't, it doesn't fit in the five year um, strategic planning cycle. Like innovation doesn't fit with five year strategic cycles really. Like innovations aren't, you don't plan it on year three and say, well, this is when we do the really cool innovation on year three. It just happens at random. And it's building an organization where that CEO gets to see these opportunities to actually access the base of the pyramid to add bigger value. And they don't get screened out by the natural structure in the organization. That's why hierarchy is a, is a big issue because it filters out the, you know, sort of the real innovation and making the, uh, the organization open to it um, and willing to debate it is like, I, I think the important part. Good. Vince, do you want to just add comments or thoughts? Because Vince, um, and please introduce yourself in the background you already have. Hi, Vince. <laughs> hi, hi uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would maybe add the layer that, uh, you know, HP, I, I think the examples that you gave, uh, including uh, the, the Philippine case, is a it's a disadvantage or an advantage that was easy for us to see because in a developing economy it, it's uh, you know such pains are very blatant they're very explicit and and, and finding them uh it, it's probably it, it's easier than uh than when things are okay and uh you, opportunities are usually about making things better and it's mm -hmm. harder to see that as opposed to a, a zero to one uh where we're, we're creating a consumption out of uh but where there were no consumers before. So that was the case for uh, for Gcash, which actually preceded Enpesa by two years. Um, and and it, maybe even Manila Water. Uh, it's when we we took over from government, um, you know, a really lousy infrastructure that was losing 60, uh, 64% of water, you know, either through pilferage or, you know, it was unpaid. So not only did we, you know, fix the infrastructure, we we had uh, special business models for those who could not afford to pay for for the utility, but but you know since we looked at them as uh, collectives with a uh, with a you know very subsidized rate, the the the, the non consumers who used to pilfer um, or and even break the infrastructure, they became consumers. So mm -hmm. that that was a case of uh, of converting non consumers. But then again, it was easy um, to 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 do that because. The pain is so obvious. Yeah. No, and I think it goes back to one of the original things I said of understanding the beneficiary's problem that you're trying to solve. And if you really understand the problem, the innovative solution starts emerging from that problem. If you really understand what's going wrong, what's what's not working, then you can create the true innovation that is really compelling, both from a financial point of view and from a beneficiary point of view. Definitely, John. Very good.
Vince, thank you. Vince is from the Ayala Group, and they are basically working at the top of the pyramid as well as the bottom of the pyramid and really, really making a change in the whole Philippines economy uh, through corporate innovation and corporate entrepreneurship and social stuff. So I think, John, Vince, you guys might want to talk for more research yeah. or conversations also. Yeah. So with that, um, you know, I think, um, John, we've come to the end of this conversation for the audience who's tuning in. And um, we, we can continue talking, uh, but we want to let the audience go. And for those who want to stick around, we'll keep on talking for a few four minutes. So what, what I'd like to do is give you the last minute, just one you know, one minute to say, guys, here's what you have to do. Here's what you might want to do. And then we'll wrap up and then we'll continue talking. Okay. So the last parting thought that I didn't share in the presentation, which is really important, is innovation and social innovation is really hard. There's a lot of failure along the way. So the key element in all of this, just innovating for profit or innovating to add social impact is being able to fail and rise again. Um, that's the thing which differentiates corporations who are successful, individuals which are successful. Every idea won't work the first time. There's lots like thousands of failed ideas for every one which is successful. Um, so learning that that's part of the inherent process here on innovation is a, is a key element to take away um, as you move forward on any innovation. And that's it. Very so good. thank you for the, the time of everyone today. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciated um, the questions as well. So thank you. So thank you. John is a professor, uh, adjunct professor at HES in Switzerland. He is a professional, uh, experienced practitioner uh, in corporate America, corporate Europe, corporate everywhere. He is a high tech guy and um, he recognizes that one of the impact that we can make through corporations is on our society. Uh, ESG, call it people, planet, profit, and all that. And he encourages all of us to think carefully when defining an innovation, what are the other parameters of value that you can deliver? And maybe those might be more valuable on the long run than you can imagine. And that's the most important thing that, that, that I think we are sharing over here. And please reach out to him directly. And, and, and um, I think we've learned a lot, John. Thank you very much for doing that. And in our philosophy of Jimmy Think Tank, um, if we want to do big, bold, breakthrough innovation, we have to work together this is an example of John talking about how he's doing it and our philosophy is together we can and we will. Thank you very much, everybody. Tune in next week.